This meeting is called to order. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the City of Boynton Beach City Commission meeting. Today is June 7th, 2022, and the time is now 6.12 p.m. As with all of our meetings, to ensure that all voices are heard and protected, and the Commission may conduct the business of the City, the rules of civility and decorum will be enforced in accordance with their City's Decorum Ordinance and Florida Statute 871.01. When discussing an item, commissioners must first be recognized by the chair and not interrupt the speaker. We don't really have that issue. Public comments must be addressed to the city commission as a whole, not to any individual on the dais or in the audience. Displays of rudeness, insults, or personal attacks are strictly prohibited, and disruptive behaviors from the audience, yelling of any sort and similar acts are not permitted. Uh, if, if there's any disruptive behavior, as you know, there will always be a warning provided, but should they persist, we will take appropriate measures. If you are asked to leave for any reason, you will not be readmitted to the chambers. Madam Clerk, please begin the roll call. Mayor Panserga. I am here. Mayor Cruz. Present. Commissioner Hay. Present. Commissioner Turkin. Present. Commissioner Kelly. Here. Mayor, you have a quorum. Our invocation for this evening will be led by Rabbi Michael Simon of Temple Beth Kodesh and immediately followed by the Pledge of Allegiance led by Commissioner Kelly. Um, I've been informed that we're having some technical issues with Rabbi Simon. So if we don't hear from Rabbis, Rabbi Simon, I'd like to ask for uh, Commissioner Hay if you could lead the invocation instead. Um, Rabbi Simon, we are ready. Let's all stand for the invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance. It appears he's still having. Sorry, Mayor. This is Manny. Uh, we're still having technical issues with Rabbi Simon. I'm sorry to say. All right. We'll hear from Board Member Hay. Let us pray. Father, once again, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this liquid sunshine. We ask now that you be in the midst of this. Uh, commission meeting tonight to guide our minds and our hearts that we may make the right decision for the betterment of this city and its citizens. Bless these staff members, uh, this entire commission. We pray that Boynton Beach will be the city that you would have it to be. We pray for those who have lost loved ones during this pandemic and pray for those who uh, your hand of protection against uh, this monkey virus that's coming around. We pray, Father, that we will take precautions and wear our masks or whatever we must do to prevent this virus from spreading. And we will be so careful to give you all the honor and praise. For it's in your Savior's name we pray. Let every heart say amen. amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Moving on to agenda approval, any additions, deletions, and corrections? Um, I have one small item to add. I'd like to hear and get consensus from my colleagues how many would like to attend the National League of Cities Conference. So that'll be a quick item. Um, and I was re requested from staff to remove item 7B. Let me pull that up. That is in relation to the intersections in Forest Park community. Mm -hmm. That item is not quite ready, so we're gonna pull that. Um, but just those two items for me. Is there anything else from the other board members? Um, yes, I'd, I'd like to ask legal, can we table or postpone 12B and 12C? So um, legal, would you wanna chime in? Yeah, you can um, postpone it. I don't know that there's a there's a deadline on it. It would just need to be done, maybe at the next meeting or whatnot. Uh, so we can, if we're going to uh, use the property payers tax collector, we can get it on uh, for the upcoming fiscal year. That's that's what this is for. Great. Yes, I, I'd like to get some more information about this. Okay. Um, if that's okay with my colleagues. Absolutely. So I know I, I would like to hear more information as well. So what I would recommend, uh, Commissioner Turkin, is that when the item comes up. Let's ask for more information. And if we're not satisfied with that information, let's continue, let's table this item. Thank you. All right. Anything else from any of my colleagues? Mayor. Yes, Commissioner. I had um I would like to 
um, I don't know where to put it on the agenda, but I would like to get an update on um, Harvey Oyer Park and the status of the uh, the upgrades to, I was out there recently and there's rope up and there's holes in the ground and there's railings off of the docks. And I just am looking for an update on um, where we are in that, um, the update, the renovation process of the boat ramps and also the piers and the docks, um, if we could get an update on that. City manager, is that something we could get a quick update on today or would you prefer a future agenda item? I believe we can probably respond to it. Uh, let me do some quick research and I'll get back with you. Let's put that under city manager's report today. Okay. Second. Anything else for my colleagues? Yep. Um, I'd like to add a future agenda item, consideration of amendment to land development and zoning regulations. Could you specify which and what about it? Um, specifically adding a potential requirement of a minimum commercial space um, percentage to mixed use developments. Understood, let's put that under future agenda. I agree, I think we need some clarity on that. And we have also uh, under city manager's report an update on the Oyer boat ramp. All right, hearing no other amendments, we have a motion to approve the agenda as amended to approve we have a motion second there's a second all those in favor of amending the agenda as, as stated say aye aye uh, aye all those opposed say no the ayes have it the motion passes unanimously moving on to informational items by members of the commission let's begin with uh, commissioner hay um i really don't have uh, that many I've spent most of the time out of town uh, enjoying my grandkids so, so um, but I I do want I do want to let the audience know that the feeding of uh, South Florida um, has changed from Thursday Thursday morning to Saturday morning uh, at the same location and let me also say uh, this may be talked about later about the uh, the Juneteenth uh, celebration that's going to be here here in Boynton uh, it's a celebration of freedom, uh, which is going to be held Sunday, June 19th, uh, from 12 p.m. to 5 p.m. at the Sarah Sims Park, which is at uh, 204 Northwest 9th Avenue. There will be food trucks and music and entertainment, um, kids' activity. Uh, there will be uh, living the, the rhythm drummers uh, for entertainment. Uh, the Hope Can't Lie comedian, Miles Blackman, the youth praise dancer, uh, Chris Freeman is a motivational speaker. And there will be more activities. Uh, so please come out uh, Sunday, June 19th, uh, beginning at 12 until 5, and enjoy this uh, great activity, June 19, June 10th. Thank you, Commissioner Vice uh, Mayor Cruz. Nothing to report, um, but I did want to say that we do have an event coming up Thursday, June 16th. It's the Boynton Beach Food, Wine and Brew Fest. Uh, it's done by the Chamber of Commerce, really excited for it. And it's going to be again on June 16th from 6 to 9 p.m. at Benvenuto's. Thank you. As for myself, I have no updates or disclosures for today's agenda. Um, Commissioner Turkin. Uh, I do not have any disclosures. I would like to mention uh, the Lionfish Derby is this Saturday at the uh, Boynton Marina. Uh, it's a great event. I encourage everyone to go 12 to 4 p.m. Excellent. Commissioner Kelly. That was the only thing I was going to. I don't have any information. I was just going to remind everyone about the Lionfish Derby. All right, great. Moving on to announcements, community and special events and presentations. Uh, the first announcement is that we are having community input meetings for the Park System Master Plan, if that's something you're interested in. We highly encourage you to participate uh, at the Boynton Beach Arts and Cultural Center Event Hall, 125 East Ocean Avenue, right across the street, on June 8th, 2022, at 6.30 p.m. Um, moving on to our first proclamation of the evening. Proclamation recognizing June 19th, 2022, as Juneteenth Day, a celebration of freedom, 
Boynton Strong members, Irvin Sineas, T.K. Newton, and Tori Orr will accept the proclamation. Gentlemen, before you come up, um, I will first uh, read the proclamation, okay? Uh, whereas Juneteenth or Juneteenth Independence Day commemorates the traditional observance of the end of slavery in the United States and is ob observed annually on June 19th, and whereas President Abraham Lincoln declared that in giving freedom to the slave, we assure freedom to the free, honorable alike in what we give and what we preserve. We shall nobly save or meanly lose the last best hope of earth. And whereas on January 1st, 1863, President Lincoln and they issued the Emancipation Proclamation, declaring that all persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of a state, the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States, shall be then henceforward and forever free. And whereas President Lincoln correctly believes slavery to be in violation of the principles of the Declaration of Independence and that its abolition represented a new birth of freedom for the United States. And whereas more than two years would pass before the news reached African-Americans living in Texas, when on June 19th, 1865, Union Major General Gordon Granger and his regiment arrived in Galveston and spread the word that slavery had been abolished. And whereas the following year, the first official Juneteenth celebrations took place in Texas and have continued across the United States throughout the years. And whereas emancipation in Florida was proclaimed in Tallahassee on May 20th, 1865. And for this reason, Floridians traditionally celebrate Emancipation Day on May 20th. And whereas Juneteenth is the oldest nationally recognized celebration com commemorating the end of slavery. And whereas Juneteenth is an important opportunity to honor the principles of the Declaration of Independence and celebrate the achievements and contributions African Americans have made and continue to make in Florida and across our nation. Now, therefore, I, Ty Serga, Mayor of the City of Boynton Beach, Florida, do hereby proclaim and extend greetings and best wishes to all observing June 19th, 2022 as Juneteenth Day. How y'all doing today? Uh, 106 Northeast 7th Avenue, Tory Orr. Um, y'all know uh, this war means, uh, with this emancipation proclamation, it means a lot to me. You know, I found out about Juneteenth maybe about five years ago myself. And um, I came, I brought it here to Stephen Grant. And he was told me, he said, man, we're fight for it. You don't know what telling might happen. You know, and this is the end result of it in Boynton Beach. And I want to, uh, you know, thank everybody, you know, who helped us, helping us as well, just getting this done. You know, big shot to the city of Boynton. Um, big shot to, to Tiki Newton. You know, I can never stop appreciating her. Um, I want to give a big shot to Miss Mary, you know, to the marketing directors here, Miss. Oh, there she go better. <laughs> you feel me, Miss Eleanor and her staff? I really appreciate her. You know, my brother Irvin's here. So, you know, they're going to, all three of them are going to say a few things. And uh, I appreciate y'all. Um, Irvin Sinais, um, I won't say um, much, but I also want to put in a thanks to just the overall community and all the organizations in the community, especially in District 2. We're nothing without them. Everything we do is because of the community. So um, we appreciate the community at large. Um, and I don't have much to add. Um, you guys really went over what the history is about. Um, but I do want to add that um, even though um, Juneteenth 
um, marks the knowledge of knowing that slavery ended. Um, a lot of the conditions that mirrored slavery, uh, such as Jim Crow, mass incarceration, suppressed civil rights, and just the overall fight against uh, racism um, still remain even to this day. So we use Juneteenth as a, a great time to celebrate um, how far we've come as a community and also to be inspired to think about where we want to go and how we want this to, to look going into the future. So appreciate everybody. Wait, hold on. We she's scared to have Miss Tiki talk about just the event a little bit more. Um, the 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 performers, the vendors, this and that. You can't hide Miss Tiki. Let's go. <laughs> Hi everyone. I just want to thank the commission and the board members, especially the city of Boynton employees who we've been working so close with, Ms. Eleanor, Gabrielle. Thank you all for having patience with us during this time. I am Tiki Newton. I am now a Boynton resident for the past four five years. Um, and I'm coordinating this event. So it's been a lot of work for me working with Mr. Orr, but <laughs> I love him. And we just want to thank you guys for giving us the opportunity. There will be entertainment for the whole family. There will be face painting for the kids. We also have a kid's gym that's coming out. We have food trucks. We have small business vendors that are coming out to share their crafts with us. Um, just something to do for everyone. So we want everyone to come out, enjoy. There's plenty of food, we're gonna dance, we're gonna enjoy that day and make it go down in history. And we hope to continue having this event annually in the city of Boynton. Thank you. Hey. Absolutely, Commissioner, go ahead. Okay, uh, those of you uh, who would like to have more information, we have flyers here about the June 10th. So if you want uh, one of these just uh, pass them around, yeah. but but I need to remain in, so don't take them all because I'm going to be handing those out at the uh Phoenix South Florida on Saturday. All right, I just want to thank all of you that spoke. Um, I know all of you have taken a great role in organizing this event, and if you've ever organized an event, it's not easy. So, thank you for taking leadership on that. Moving on to our next uh, proclamation for Alzheimer's and Brain Awareness Month. This proclamation will be accepted by uh, David Chavez Lopez, bilingual program manager, Ryan Schiff, public policy manager, Keith Gibson, and director of diversity, equity, and inclusion of the Alzheimer's Association, Southeast Florida chapter. The proclamation reads as follows. Whereas the health and safety of all Floridians is important to the happiness, prosperity, and well-being of our state's families, communities, and economy, Alzheimer's disease is a progressive brain disease that slowly deteriorates brain cells, affecting one's reasoning skills and abilities to perform simple tasks, ultimately leading to memory loss. And whereas Alzheimer's cases in Florida are expected to increase 24% from 580,000 in 2020 to more than 720,000 in 2025, 806,000 Floridians provided over 1.267 million hours of unpaid care for individuals with Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease, which currently has no cure, is the sixth leading cause of death in adults age 18 or older in the United States. With no currently definitive interventions to prevent Alzheimer's essentials, public health services of early detection, risk reduction, and surveillance are necessary to protect and improve the health of our citizens. And whereas during the month of June, citizens across Florida take part in the longest day to raise awareness and support research and care for Alzheimer's. Further research of Alzheimer's is critical as it is the only cause of death among the top 10 causes in the United States that currently cannot be prevented, cured, or even slowed. And whereas nearly 50% of individuals with increased memory problems reported they had not discussed their symptoms with the healthcare provider, yet early and documented diagnosis when coupled with access to care, planning services lead to better outcomes for individuals with Alzheimer's, as well as their caregivers. Caregivers and family members are crucial in maintaining a healthy quality of life for those battling the disease. And whereas changing the trajectory of Alzheimer's disease requires public health tools and techniques that help alter the course of heart disease, cancer, HIV, HIV and AIDS in our state, encouraging healthy behaviors to reduce the risk 
of co-occurring conditions, decreasing the number of people with undiagnosed dementia, improving medical management of dementia and comorbidities, and assisting family caregivers with getting support to help them sustain their vital role. And whereas it is imperative that Floridians with Alzheimer's receive early diagnosis and have access to quality, affordable care, and that further research of this disease continues. Now, therefore, I, Ty Pinserga, Mayor of the City of Boynton Beach, Florida, do hereby recognize the month of June 2022 as Alzheimer's and Brain Awareness Month. Commissioner, uh, Vice Mayor Cruz. All right, uh, I wanna thank the Alzheimer's Association for working with us um, and getting this proclamation. And this hits pretty close to home. My grandmother on my father's side died of Alzheimer's. So I know personally it's in my family um, and I'm sure it's in a lot of our families. So I think it's uh, beneficial for us in Boynton Beach to get educated on this, um, even for our public safety um, people as well. And um, the Alzheimer's Association provides a program, uh, a free training program that maybe um, David will speak to. And that's all. Uh, I would hope that if we can turn the uh, water tower purple, maybe for a week or so, to represent Alzheimer's uh, Month, city manager, if that would be possible. Yes, ma'am, we can do that. Awesome. Okay. All right, absolutely, you wanna do it together? Hello, everybody. Um, hello, uh, City of Boynton Beach. I uh, just wanted to say a um, very special thank you, um, Mayor Pesangera, also Vice Mayor Cruz, um, and all the commissioners here. Um, this is uh, very important um, what you're doing here with this proclamation. Um, as I know firsthand, um, as the program manager for Palm Beach County, how many families, um, how many individuals are being affected by Alzheimer's disease uh, and by so many other dementias as well. So just to give you um, a little bit of some information, here in Palm Beach County, uh, 52,000 residents are currently living with Alzheimer's disease. Um, there's about 14% of the population and Palm Beach County has the highest percentage of residents uh, living with Alzheimer's disease in the state of Florida. So really we do have um, a number of our uh, citizens here uh, dealing with this. Um, we also know, um, as you mentioned, Mayor, that the disease not only affects the individual, but those around them, their families, their caregivers. So we of course wanna provide uh, programs and services for them. And the Alzheimer's Association has the 24-hour helpline uh, available um, in over 200 languages, uh, providing master level uh, clinician um, service through uh, care consultations. So we have that available for caregivers. And of course, we also have education, support groups, um, and a number of resources. Um, also, um, Vice Mayor, you mentioned um, the educational piece. So the educational piece is very key um, in understanding what is Alzheimer's disease, what is dementia. And we're trying to turn uh, Florida into a dementia-friendly state. And how we're going to do that also through the Department of Elder Affairs um, is through a program called All Stars, which is um, 
45 minute educational program that can be done online at uh, allstars.org. And I have some information on that, uh, but it's pretty much learning the resources, uh, learning what are the 10 warning signs of Alzheimer's disease, um, and also connecting individuals with what is available. So thank you so much, and uh, I appreciate this very much. Thank you. Thank you. Our third and final proclamation for the evening is for National Home Ownership Month. This is going to Habitat for Humanity and their CEO and president, uh, Jennifer Thomason, is here today to accept it. The proclamation reads as follows. Whereas home ownership is defined as an individual owning a home in which they live, allowing them to become a permanent member of the community and having an investment to pass down to future generations. And whereas Habitat for Humanity is South Palm Beach County offers programs to increase home ownership and affordable housing opportunities to residents of South Palm Beach County. And whereas Habitat for Humanity of South Palm Beach County encourages home ownership and promotes the accessibility of quality, affordable housing as a vital aspect of maintaining a robust, stable community. And whereas Habitat for Humanity acknowledges that home ownership plays a critical role in strengthening families and is a pathway to self-sufficiency improve health and quality of life, and whereas Habitat for Humanity offers homeowner educational programs which gives families the tools and information that can improve their financial future, and whereas Habitat for Humanity maintains active partnerships with financial institutions, social service agencies, businesses, community housing providers, and others to enhance a commitment to successful communal actions to increase the prospects of ensuring affordable housing obtainability. Now, therefore, I, Ty Pinserga, Mayor of the City of Boynton Beach, do hereby proclaim the month of June 22, 2022, as National Home Ownership Month. Good evening, everyone. Uh, good to see you again. And this is very important to us. This is really the first time that we've ever done anything like this. And home ownership is a huge, um, a huge thing to obtain for somebody. We have um, 89 homeowners in your city, and we're about to have our 90th coming. Um, out of all of our municipalities, Boca Raton, Delray, and Boynton the most are in Boynton Beach. And it's because of the support of the city and everything you do to make sure that we have access to the land, that we are able to either bring new homeowners to the city or provide homes for your existing residents. So we are very excited about this. We have been surveying this area for since 1991, and we look forward to many more years working with the city, building more in Boynton Beach and providing affordable housing for those that work very hard and, and work very hard to get themselves in those homes. So thank you all so much, I appreciate it. Thank you. Before we begin public audience, this is just a reminder that individual speakers are limited to three minutes per meeting. Uh, public audience is not a Q&A. Uh, we, uh, members of the commission and staff, we will take notes of what's said today, and we will respond to them after the meeting has concluded. Uh, for those of you that are joining us virtually and wish to speak, please keep your digital hands raised throughout the duration of in-person public comments. After the in-person public comments have concluded, we will no longer accept virtual participants. I will also inform you, the virtual speakers, when you have 30 seconds remaining on the clock. Again, public comments must be addressed to the city commission as a whole, not to any individual on the dais or in the audience. Displays of insults or personal attacks are prohibited and disruptive behaviors from the audience, yelling, that sort of thing, and similar behaviors are obviously not permitted. Uh, let's begin with our in-person public comments. If you'd like to approach the podium, we have two on both sides. And I'd like to ask if, uh, Chief, if you could move over blocking the 
timer just a little bit. All right, I see Bishop Wright is on the podium. Begin when you're ready, sir. Good evening, everybody on the dais. Good evening. City manager, attorney, and all. To God be the glory and audience. I, 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 no, I don't know if I could do this in three minutes, but let me say, first and foremost, I want to talk about two cultures we're taking from us. We want to see restored. Baseball, we want to get that diamond back, and we want to get diving boats. We want to renovate that pool. Y'all made it a kiddie pool. You all didn't. But thank God for you all. Now we're talking about history being made. We're getting restoration because these two cultures are very serious. And nobody's really talking about it. I've been talking about it for nine years. We need to get the diamond back. Thank God for our chief there who's committed himself in his word with every resource he has. He loved baseball too. And God knows I loved it. Played it too, to bone. Listen, and so uh, when we did the free summer camp, we was able to start these children playing baseball out there. And man, you'll be surprised. And one day they was hitting and catching. I mean, amazingly, but at any rate, those are two things I'd like for y'all to put on this agenda. Let's get together in that respect. But I want to talk about something real quickly about fatherhood, some facts on this, okay? 24 million children live without their biological fathers. Approximately 86% of men in jail and 98% of all men on death row were raised by one parent, single mothers. About 40% of children in father absent homes have not seen their fathers at all during the past year. 20% of absent fathers live in a different state than their children. 50% of children living in father absent homes have never set foot in their father's home. Now, this is a research come from research conducted by Dr. Catherine May for the March of Dying found that father's behavior had a direct impact not only on the mother's willingness to seek early and regular prenatal care, but also on whether or not she used drugs during her pregnancy. And being a parent, this is how serious it is. Now, this brings me all the way around with the minute and 19 seconds I got. We still on the move. We haven't backed up. We're in a hurricane in the center of that storm right now, but it's coming. The flood is coming, to God be the glory, about justice and equality for SJ, for this community, my family and everybody's family in this city. So we're not quiet and respect that we've forgotten this, pass on this, because this is as serious a matter as anyone who have ever fallen by systemic racism, white supremacy. The face has nothing to do with it per se. If you promoting it, if you sit there and you are silent, then you are down with it one way or another. So we're talking about justice and equality in this city. Let's get this IA conclusive. We don't want to wait till the whole 180 days. I would like to see them stop at 169, 170, not just go to the 180 because that would show me purpose for the little done. So uh, let's put in mind these two cultures. We got place back in Boynton. Uh, we'll never see Boynton together again. Culture and history is so very important. Without knowing anything about it, you're like a tree without roots. You better no fruit. God bless y'all. Have a great day. Enjoy. Thank you. Next speaker. Good evening. Good evening. Hi, um, I'm Cassandra Corbin Thaddeus again from Connect to Greatness. And you all know our organization. I talk about it a lot. It is to inspire and empower African American black male students to be leaders and change makers in the world. Um, what you all might not know, my, might not know is um, over the last couple of years, um, due to everything people have already kind of laid out in terms of statistically um, what's happening in the systems, especially education and others where our black male students sit and um, where they live, uh, there it's very complicated in terms of the, um, the stressors that our students have. Um, including uh, those in the system as well as health, all the things that we all know about. And so one of the things that we did over the last couple of years is introduce um, uh, mindfulness and yoga to our students. And we found that that was a new solution that our, many of our students had never even experienced before or knew was available to them. And so having, act, having had that access really gave them some new coping mechanisms and some tools for themselves. And so one of the things that we wanted to um, have my friend here, Pablo um, Del Riel, he's going to talk a little bit about um, a partnership that we are forging, because what we want to do is, is really make this tool available to more students here in Boynton, and specifically at the high school. Um, we work with students right now uh, at Boynton Beach High School, and so that's one of the things that we want to share with um, all of you today. So, Yeah, um, thank you. And my name is Pablo Del Real, and I'm here with my friend Cassandra Corbin Thaddeus to talk a little bit about a, a problem uh, and a solution. I think a lot of us are aware that youth mental health, mental wellness is in crisis. 
Uh, there is a youth mental illness crisis. We see it in different ways. Uh, we see it on the news, uh, and uh, we don't see it in many ways as well. It's hidden oftentimes. I'm with Soil and Soul. We're a local nonprofit agency that teaches mindfulness and eco healing. I'll just stick to mindfulness for tonight. But mindfulness thumbnail sketch is the supervision of attention. So we work with high school students through high school mindfulness clubs, and we teach them how to supervise their attention, where to put it, where not to put it, how to regulate it, how to manage the thoughts, the emotions. You know, you might not uh, know the numbers, but we have anywhere from 5,000 to 50,000 thoughts a day, most of them negative, most of them repetitive. And if a high school student is not in an environment with strong social bonds, that can help them regulate those thousands of negative thoughts every day. Uh, that can that can be very stressful, can be uh, depressing, can be very anxiety uh, driven. So when we work with high school students in high school mindfulness clubs, we teach them how to manage their attention, which also alleviates the depression, the anxiety, and the stress because those are attentional disorders. Too much attention on the past, depression. Too much attention on the future, anxiety inability to be present in the moment. So we want to bring together a mindfulness club to Boynton Beach High. I've been working with students at Atlantic High and Delray Beach for four years now. We've been at Inlet Grove and uh, High and Riviera Beach for also four years. We've been at Lake Worth for a few years. Uh, we're at John I. Leonard this past year and we want to come to Boynton Beach. So we're here to invite you to support us on this journey. We don't know exactly what kind of support we're going to need yet, but we know we'll need some. Uh, and we uh, will will appreciate your guidance along the way to support our young people in finding belonging that they need uh, and finding the ability to regulate uh, their thoughts and emotions in healthy ways so we don't end up with uh, violence here at Boynton High. Thank you. Thank you to both of you and the work that you're doing. And next speaker, please approach the podium. Begin when you are ready. And if there's anybody else, we do have two podiums, one on each side. Commissioners, my name is Edward Tedman. Um, the reason I'm here tonight is uh, I'd like to have driver access to the book drop for the library. It would be so much more convenient. Um, the county's uh, library on Lantana Road, you can drive right up uh, to the book drop and drop your books. And otherwise, here, you have to go out in the parking lot and hike a quarter of a mile to get to <laughs> the book drop. Um, this could be uh, more accessible if that loop coming around were one way. And I presume that that, uh, that, that access to this on, from, from the street there is, was made for drop off for people, I guess. But it could still be done with the uh, with 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 the um, redirection of the traffic, so that uh, we could drop the the driver can drop off the book without having to get out of the car and go walking all over the place in 85 degree weather. Um, the the uh, I think that can that can be done, or we could relocate the book drop so that we could have access for the driver to drop off the books. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Good evening. Evangeline Ward, 1518 North Sea Crest Boulevard, Born to Beach, Florida. And the reason I'm here, um, when we were uh, discussing, and there's so many activities that are coming, you know, upcoming for this month and everything, and with so much going around with gun violence, I want to know what kind of type of security do we have? for our, you know, our children and our citizens when they're out with all these activities, because we never know. Uh, have we beefed up? Are we gonna do anything to make sure that we don't have any repercussions in our, you know, areas? That's my concern. Thank you. And, and just so you're aware, the police chief is in the back. So if you wanna reach out to him, we can answer that question very quickly. Uh, yes, sir, please begin when you're ready. Good afternoon, my name is Rick. Um, I bring a concern 
not only to the uh, kids that ride trail bikes, but to the public in general. Um, as this gentleman back here spoke of a kiddie pool being turned into a swimming pool and a diamond refurbished for use as baseball, I bring another suggestion so some of our kids that drive trail bikes don't have to die. And that is a local, easily accessible place to ride a trail bike where for a permit that affixes to the bike, you have use of that facility. Two, a law on the books structured saying that a gentleman or female with a trail bike has free passage on a city street to go to and from the riding area and to and from a place to get gas for their dirt bike to keep them off the street and give them a constructive place to play with their toy. That's all I have. Thank you. Bryce Graham, second vice president, National National Network, Central Florida chapter, 163 days. We have come to this place with one demand, and that is the demand of justice for Stanley Dell Davis III. Martin Luther King said, justice delayed is justice denied. And there has been a delay in this city when it comes to justice. We've called for the firing of the officer of Mark Zone, and we have nothing. We've called for charges to be brought against him, and still we have nothing. I've come tonight to say that we have waited long enough. And we cannot wait until 180 days for you all to make a decision in this city, which is so visibly and clearly a violation to you all's policy and procedures, which this officer has viciously violated time and time again. Might I say I have sent a letter to all of you commissioners about moving forward with police reform, bringing in an expert, and still I have not heard from none of you. It was a suggestion and an introduction with somebody who I have worked with across this country and in the state of Florida who knows how to bring about police reform. And so I would ask of you to give me a response, because when you engage with change, you bring about change. And when you work with those who work with change, you will see about a change in Boynton Beach. Thank you so much. Next speaker. Wesley Shula, 618 Northwest 2nd Street. Um, why are we not getting to the place that we need to get to? Because at the end of the day, we're not getting the answers that we need. It's still up under you. you you're still hauling uh, investigation. And the guy, it's time to the point that it's time for him to go. And if his record is where they say his record is at, why are we not trying to make a move? Because it seems like we still paying for him to be on vacation doing nothing. And nothing is not gonna bring nothing to us by y'all just sitting around, kicking the can down the road. This is now the time that y'all need to deal with this situation because it seems like y'all maybe be trying to cover this up and we're not gonna go nowhere. So you could deal with it or we gonna deal with it another type of way. And the way that we're gonna deal with it, seems like we need to bring other people in because it seems like we're not getting the answers that we need. As a city manager, I understand you done had one chief resign, you done had another one resign. So we don't wanna hear about that the investigation is stalling right now. We need this guy fired. 
And if somebody send you an email, why are y'all not responding to none of the emails? And as you, the mail, vacation is over, the school is closed. So you should be on your business, handling your business, because we want answers. And if we can't get no answers, I don't know what we're gonna do, but I know it ain't gonna be with the Lord, it's gonna be with you. Any other in-person speakers, this is the last call. Please approach the podium. Now is the time to do that. Seeing no one else approaching the podium, we're going to move on to the virtual speakers. Uh, if somebody could tell me if anybody's online. Mani, is anybody online? With uh, their hands raised. We have no hands raised at this moment. We have no hands raised. All right. So that concludes public audience. Thank you, everybody. Moving on to section five, which is administrative, appoint eligible members of the community to serve in vacant positions on city advisory boards. Let's pull that up. Beginning with the building board of adjustments and appeals, uh, Commissioner Turkin, uh, you are the first and we have an ap applicant here. It is Alexander Ranbaum. I believe Alexander is the only applicant, correct? That is correct. Uh, I'd like to move forward. All right, may I have a motion then? Second. <laughs> So that was really fast. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor of appointing Alexander Randbaum to the Building Board of Adjustments and Appeals say aye. 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 All those who oppose, the ayes have it. The motion passes unanimously. Moving on to Education and Youth Advisory Board. Again, Commissioner Turkin, you are first. We have one applicant, Nicole Pardo, excuse me, Padro, uh, as an alternate to the Education and Youth Advisory Board. Uh, I'd like to go ahead and move for that appointment. All right. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, the ayes have it. Motion passes unanimously. Historic Resources Preservation Board, Commissioner Turkin, it is still you. And uh, we have one, uh, one applicant, also Alexander Randbaum, for a regular seat on that board. Uh, I'd like to move for Alex to be appointed. Okay. Second from anyone? Second. We have a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. The ayes have it. Motion passes unanimously. Moving on to library board. Uh, Commissioner Kelly, you are up for an appointment for a regular board seat to the library board. Nicole Padro is the only applicant. I will move to uh, appoint her to that board. Okay. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. The ayes have it. Motion passes unanimously. Moving on to the Senior Advisory Board, Vice Mayor Cruz, it is your appointment for a regular board seat. We have two applicants, uh, Danny Farrell and Anne Sinar. I'm not sure if I'm Swiner. Right. Swiner. I, thank you for that correction. Mr. Farrell emailed me and told me he's a veteran. He gave me his uh, background. He seems like a good fit. He's a senior citizen and he lives here in District 4. I'm going to go ahead and appoint Mr. Danny Farrell to the Senior Advisory Board. All right, we have a motion. Is there a second? Second. And there is a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those who oppose say no. The ayes have it. The motion passes unanimously. I believe that is it. Moving on to, is there one we more? Do have, Did I miss one? Well, what about Ann Swino? Does she have the option? Oh, yes, we have another appointment. Excuse me. Uh, that is... Uh, Commissioner Hay, that is your appointment for an alternate. Right, uh, Ann Schwino as an alternate. All right, yeah, I would, uh, I'd second that. I know Ms. Schwino, she's a very nice lady. Good, yeah. good, excellent. Uh, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Aye, aye. all those opposed say no. The ayes have it, motion passes unanimously. Thank you everybody and thank you for that catch. Moving on to item 5B, ratify the selection of Sandra Watson as the chair and Judy Lyman as the vice chair of the senior advisory board. Motion to approve. Sorry. We have a motion and a second to ratify the selection of Sandra Watson as the chair and Judy Lyman as the vice chair of the senior advisory board. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those who oppose, the ayes have it. The motion passes unanimously. Congratulations. Yay. I see both of you here. Do you guys want to take a picture? Yeah, yeah okay. I, I think they do. I, All right, come on. I was the chair of the senior advisory board, before, okay. so I know them. Okay, cool. Let me get my phone.
They're very sweet. All right, you're very welcome. We are now moving on to consent agenda. Are there any items under consent ag agenda that members of this commission would like to pull? I yes, know Mayor. I would like to pull item E. E? E. Okay, all right. And and for yourself, Commissioner? Uh, no, that's the same one I was same gonna one. pull, it's E. <laughs> H. I, I wanna talk about 6H. 6H, let me pull that as well. Any others? All right, we have a motion to approve the remainder of the consent agenda. So move. We have a motion and do we have a second? second. We have a second. All those in favor of approving the remainder of the consent agenda say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. The ayes have it, motion passes unanimously. Let's address them in order. So item E reads, authorize the finance department to reduce the allowance for uncollectible accounts and the accounts receivable accounts by 1 million uh, $9,666.96. This amount reflects the unpaid ALS transportation billings that have been in collection for 12 months or longer. This write-off is for 2017 uncollected EMS transport revenue. And I see we have our fire chief here. Uh, could you tell us about this item and we'll address questions uh, from the commission. Absolutely, Mayor, Vice Mayor and Commissioners. Hugh Bruder, Interim Fire Chief. Uh, this write-off is consistent with what we do every year. Uh, we are uh, obligated by uh, state ordinance, by state regulation, to write off any uncollected EMS ALS transport revenue within four years. Uh, this particular write-off of a million and nine dollars is actually 30% of our transport revenue. Uh, last year, we wrote off $763,000, which was 33% of the transport revenue. So it's actually a little bit less than uh, the prior year. Um, Chief, my question for you is, are we doing anything differently year to year in terms of collection or how this is processed? Uh, yes, we've actually taken some steps this year. Uh, we've had some changes within the EMS uh, billing department and the fire department uh, through some attrition uh, where we've uh, decided to go ahead and outsource to Digitech billing. Uh, with Digitech billing, we're looking at the potential to increase uh, our revenue collection by between 8 and 10 percent. All right. Are there any questions or comments from the um, from the commission? Uh, Commissioner Hay, you had also pulled this item. Uh, yes. Uh, Chief, is this the norm for cities to outsource to um, other, because they have the expertise, I suppose, to uh, uh, have some methodologies to collect uncollectibles? Um, and, and are there any grants or anything like that that we could look at for offsetting? Because anything like over a million dollars, you know, it gets your attention. And um, that's a lot of money to, to write off. Um, I'm just wondering, what are we doing about it? I heard what you said. You're looking at uh, Digitech or something like that? That's correct. We've contracted with Digitech this year. We actually just transitioned in March. Uh, and they're going to also be taking our fire prevention billing over, which hopefully should increase the amount of revenue that we're collecting. These write-offs are fairly consistent with, with municipalities, you know, throughout the South Florida area. Um, these are uncollected funds. Now, what, what we actually did prior to this was that once we do the billing, we try to collect the billing for six months. 
after that point, we send to a collection agency, which tries to collect for six months. Then we actually get the money back and we get the accounts back for six months where we go ahead and try to collect those funds again. After that point in time, we hold that as uncollected debt on the balance sheet. So it, it's already shown from a financial aspect as uncollected debt. So it actually has no financial implication to the budget whatsoever, other than the fact that we would love to collect this money if we could. But that again, that is consistent with what municipalities um, are facing throughout the South Florida area. Chief, have you been able to categorize uh, the lack of uh, receiving funding in terms of area, ethnicity, or income, or is it the pandemic? Uh, what, what's what, what's the, the ground cause of it? It's just a lack of funding? Uh, I, I think what, what is being seen across the South Florida area is a lot of these transports are are um, unfortunately we're dealing with folks in, in lower socioeconomic strata. So there's there's an inability to be able to pay these transport revenue fees and, and they're they're quite costly for an ALS transport, somewhere in the seven or eight hundred dollar range. So we're just finding that individuals just don't have the ability to pay. Um, one of the other things that we're looking at is actually trying to sell this debt to a company. We may only get pennies on the dollar, but it is a way, and I've spoken to the finance director, of, of the possibility of this opportunity to see if we can at least capture some of it. But unfortunately, as I said, it's it's very consistent across the board in the South Florida area. If I may add, um, it's not just the South Florida area. This is a global issue across the country. This happens with every fire rescue department that does transport, and some are writing off much more. Um, it's speculative to just assume the socioeconomic is the other part. I want to make sure that we understand that you know there's there's maximum billing for Medicare, Medicaid that will not compensate 100% of that. So some of that write-off involves those types of things as well. Just to give you a full perspective on on what that looks like, and obviously you know I said at the fire chief's home before. So, thank you. Thank you, sir. Any other questions? That's it for me, Mayor. All right, any other questions or comments from my colleagues? Hearing none, may have, thank you so much, Chief. My we have a motion to approve item 6E. Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. The ayes have it, the motion passes unanimously. Moving on to the next polled item, which was 6H. It reads proposed resolution number R22-075. Approve and ratify the collective bargaining agreement between the city and the Boynton Beach Association of Firefighters, Florida Local 1891 of the IAFF for the term October 1st, 2022 through September 30th, 2025. Uh, city manager, would, like, would you like to begin by giving a brief overview? Yes, um, I actually was interested in, in what oh, Commissioner Turkin may that, have to, that's to say before. Fine with me, Commissioner. Oh, yeah. I ask you to take it from the top. Okay, I can do that. Um, so a attached to your background information is certainly the fiscal impact. Um, let me highlight some of the, the benefits of this for the community. Uh, when I came on board as the fire chief uh, a little over a year and a half ago, one of the biggest issues for fire rescue or law enforcement or dispatch or water uh, and sewer managers is FTEs or full-time equivalents sitting in positions and being able to serve out their their time. So I City did manager, it. could I ask you just yeah. pause one moment? If somebody could just close the door, please, so I can hear hear the speakers better. Thank you. Um, city manager, please proceed. No problem. So part of that is with the schedule that they're on, um, every absence requires somebody to fill a seat to do the job unlike an office setting where maybe somebody else picks up the phone or picks up the responsibilities of someone in the settings that I mentioned earlier, a, a human being has to be in that position to be able to serve the citizens. That button hits and opens the door every time. So we're, we're going to have that quite a bit. Um, so basically we had a uh, leave liability issue with things. When I did the analysis, there was uh, Kelly days attached. And basically what that is, is a Kelly day, they work for 2448, they have a Kelly day. So if their Kelly day falls on a Monday, they never work a Monday throughout their whole schedule. Um, with the schedule change that we look to do, we reduced the 
staffing requirement, we were averaging 15 people off a day. That's too many people. So seven of them were Kelly days. So I can cut that number in half that quick with what the changes were. So through collaborative uh, negotiation, that was the highlight of that schedule. And uh, the other part for the schedule change is we've heard about mental health. We've we banged on it for public safety personnel. Part of mental health involves decompression from the workday. So 24, 48, 48 hours is not enough to decompress, especially when I'm having to call people back in on overtime to cover those seat positions. With this schedule and with this staffing level, we won't have to do that. So that that's the highlight of the schedule side of that. It's a three-year contract for salaries, and uh, the front end is the load. I know what the economy is right now. I don't know what the economy is going to be in the next two years. So through a collaboration with the with the local, uh, we were able to build in some safeguards so the city's not writing a blank check and and having difficulty going forward. So I'm I'm proud and, and honored to share that with you. Everything's front loaded this year though, and. Uh, we, we had finance at the table, we had HR at the table, and we got to answer all those questions that I had about, okay, how does this funding work and are we there? And is it gonna be sustainable? And the answer is yes. Um, some other things that are built in with this schedule is uh, it allows for a better accountability process. There is direct supervision of specific people under direct supervisors. Uh, that was one of the other concerns I had walking in the door is that it's very whole, hard to hold people accountable when you don't have a adequate span of control of supervision to, to subordinate. So now with this built-in system, it will better meet that span of control necessity. That's pretty much the highlights of this. Uh, with, with the savings of a million dollars in overtime, we reinvested it in going after the scheduling and the salaries and things like that. There still is certainly a cost to it, but I will tell you that the city of Boynton Beach becomes the destination fire department in this area, and we will attract the best and maintain the best fire rescue employees with this, this contract. Thank you. All right, Commissioner Turkin. Um, so, so I understand, uh, you know, to kind of get back to the mental health point that you made. <clears throat> Currently, our firefighters are 2448, and this would put them at 2472? Correct. So we go from how many days a month to how many days a month? I believe it's 10 to 7, but the easier number is they go from 2,496 hours in a year. Mm -hmm. The average worker that works 40 hours a week works 2,080. We go from 2,496 to 2,190 in a year. So we're still above the, the 40 hour worker. The, the average work week comes out to about 42 hours just for math math sake. So uh, it, it's closer to a 40 hour work week for somebody. The three days of decompression though, where I'm not having to call them in on overtime it is, is really a, a huge deal. Having done this job for 38 years, I will tell you that that is that is a big deal. Being able to spend time with their families and do those types of things is is really important. When they get mandatory or held over or those types of things, they don't get that opportunity. In this situation, we probably will not be in that situation right. routinely, which we have been as of late. Right. Um, that's good. Uh, no worries. Um, my, my next question is, we, you know, to make this happen, we obviously need to bring on 21 full-time firefighters, excuse my ignorance as far as hiring goes. Um, do we, do we have part-time firefighters? Is that? We do not. Okay. Is that, is that a norm or is that something that we don't see? Cause I say that because I know we can alleviate the cost of benefits if we're not hiring full-time employees. And so I don't know if that's even feasible. I'm I'm just thinking from civilian side, right? You know what we can do to kind of save. I, I think save I understand. Dollars. Yeah, I I think I understand what you're asking, but the answer is we probably would not get people to right. be part-time firefighters. It would like, be like asking somebody to be a part-time police officer. Right. The fire rescue business, EMS, police is all 
career service. So um, th those folks would be hard pressed to, to work in a part-time setting, especially in this day and age where, you know, it, it's kind of like volunteerism. It was a really good thing through the years, but most people can't leave their job and go get on a fire truck and go help people like they did back in the day when the community, it was a community fire department like that. Um, there are so many training requirements for EMS and fire now uh, and law enforcement that you, you don't want somebody that's not qualified and you don't want somebody that's doing it as a hobby, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. So th the answer is there are reserve programs that are out there, but usually those reserve personnel are seeking full-time employment and it gives them the experience level to do that. Uh, usually reservists are not paid, but in some situations they are. I'll tell you where most of the time that works is in a college town where they're able to capture students that are gonna be there for a specific time and they give them benefits in the way of tuition or housing or things like that to help them with their educational pursuit. So they serve as <coughs> reserve firefighters or volunteer firefighters in that setting. That's the only place I've ever seen it work effectively. Right. No, thank you for clarifying that. I, I assume that I just uh, didn't didn't want that idea to go to you know not not bringing that up. Um, and my last question, I guess this is maybe for legal. Is there a way? And I don't want to speak too prematurely. Is there a way that we could allocate some of these ARPA funds towards? Can we alleviate some of the, some of those ARPA funds toward this line item? You know, I. We haven't been involved in giving, you know, reviewing those ARPA funds, but that's something we can look at with the administration to see. Um, I'm not sure though that it's any. It, 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 the, the use of ARPA funds have been widened to make up for lost revenues, so it's. I'm not saying no, but I would have to look at that. Okay. And I will tell you, to the best of my knowledge, that it cannot fund personnel. It could fund stations. It right. could fund apparatus. Right. It cannot fund people. So that that I understand, and and I know our finance director is in house. I don't want to put her on the spot to answer that, but I believe that that is the even with the expansion of the <clears throat> abilities, it's still focused on brick and mortar and apparatus and that type of thing. So we could play around with the budget, um, hypo hypothetically. I don't want to speak too much. Yeah. Too much. Okay. I, I understand your terminology. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right, thank you for those questions. I see Commissioner Hay, you have a you have a question. Yeah, it's one of those situations, one of those questions you don't like to ask, but we do know that uh, the divorce rate among police officers and firemen is pretty high. Uh, in your opinion, do you feel that the uh, the 40, 24, uh, 72 would would affect that in any way? I, I guess that's a hard uh, question, but. Uh, you know, right now it's 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 twenty four forty eight, right? Right. And we talk about going to twenty four seventy two. Correct. Um, is there is there uh, any statistics that would support or deny uh, my question as far as the relationship to the uh, to the divorce rate? Uh, you so you know what be, I'm getting at. I, I I do understand the question. Um, I don't believe that there's any empirical data or a study that's been done that's specific to uh, the marital success rate or the mar marital status based on 2448 versus 2472. Are there other cities that you know of that have the 2472? There's only one in the state of Florida that I'm aware of. Um, that's our neighbor and that's Boca. And Boca is a destination department. There are people that work in Boca that come from as far away as other states to, to work that schedule. And, uh, it's, you know, it's a desirable thing and you capture the best of the best. So you can be selective in, in who you hire and you hire the best of the best and you keep the best of the best because they want to be here. So it becomes so. a dangling carrot. Correct. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Vice Mayor Cruz, did you have any questions I, or comments? I think the idea of the 24, 72 hour schedule is really it's going to be really beneficial to improving with the overtime issue that we have going on and the staffing as well. Um, with that being said, uh, just two quick questions. One, when would the effective date be of that schedule? We, we put it around January because that allows us to hire everybody, get them oriented to the department, and then we'll be able to roll it out. But what we didn't want to do is 
shock the system with October 1, we're going to roll this out. When you hire 21 new people, they have to be brought in and oriented to the way we do things in Boynton Beach. And they become part of the team and and they understand. Um, We're going to go through promotional processes to put, you know, two new battalion chiefs, two new captains, 10 new lieutenants on a new shift. So that's a big deal. And uh, some of the other things that are contained through the contract allow us to do that with purpose and succession planning was in in place when we did that. So the answer is uh, January, on or about January 1 is when we would like to do it. We won't do it on a holiday, I promise you that, because that tends to be a bad time to roll out any new program. (laughs) So, okay, so January 2023, understood. Yes. And then um, what parameters are we going to use to make sure that we hire, like, we don't want to do this to benefit out-of-state folks. We want to make sure we benefit local people. So what are we going to do to make sure that this new great schedule is, there's an opportunity for local people to out take advantage of that? Out-of-state folks are not eligible unless they're Florida State certified firefighters. So it would only be state of Florida certified firefighters and paramedics. Can we give preference to people that are in Palm Beach County or maybe if we have... can't answer that from a legal standpoint, but I know that in other agencies that I've worked for, there were bonus points given to people that were local in the city, in the county, that type of thing. And it was a graduated scale that did that. But uh, I don't know if there's any rules here specific in this area that would address that. Yeah. Again, I could work with the manager and see whether there's an ability to put that in place. Might awesome. be something that discussed with the union. Yeah, it'd be great to help the economy here. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you. City Manager, approximately how much did we pay in overtime last year? Uh, I believe we spent $1.8 million. $1.8 million. And with these changes, are we going to be significantly reducing overtime? We will be probably $500,000 as a maximum. Okay. In the budget well, for process. The first so it's year. really one point three that we're actually recovering in in the process but we put one million to be uh cautiously optimistic or conservative but i believe that we'll see a a better return than that okay all right that answered my question uh commissioner kelly did you have any questions i just had one question the um so the the new schedule change is not immediate you're waiting until you have the additional personnel and how I mean, we hope that you can hire 21 firefighters by January, but what happens we'll if you're not? <laughs> I, I promise you it'll, it'll happen. It, one, week, one week of opening well, and we've had 40 applicants. So we're probably going to see hundreds of people applying for 21 positions. And how long is your hiring process? Well, we have condensed it. So okay. uh, it, it will be a quick turnaround. We intend to have the folks starting by October 1st. So I have October, November, and December to have them through an orientation process, to have them part of the staffing on the floor, and to actually have them as productive members of the team. So certainly when you hire somebody brand new, they don't hit the ground running in this business. It's no different than FTO process for police. So these positions are posted and you're actively... June 1st, we started with the... with the. Uh, recruiting process so thank you you're welcome <clears throat> i just want to say a couple more things um i talked to a firefighter from a different municipality and and we were talking and, and you know she had brought this up and she was saying like how pivotal this could be for her municipality and other municipalities because she did mention that boca was the only other municipality that works this schedule so when we talk about mental health and not just you know, for our firefighters, we have police officers in here too. You guys go through a lot. And so whatever we can do, I think to alleviate that is great. We're going to save some, you know, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to save, you know, about a million dollars in OT, which is fantastic. Um, my last point is this is something that I believe you and I have discussed. And I, I don't believe, I don't know if it was you or Chief DiGiulio that had brought it up when you were entering, uh, interviewing for the city manager interim position but utilizing our firefighters in other avenues to help with city operations. So I don't know if that's something that we can do, bringing on 21 additional personnel. My thoughts are code enforcement. Um, I don't know what, you know what the realities are with that, but assisting other departments with that. 
Um, obviously, you know, they're on call. They have to be ready to go. I understand that. I don't know if there's anything that we can do to assist our sister departments. Well, it's, it's a mindset. And, and I will tell you that, you know, previous agencies I've worked in, firefighters tend to contribute and jump in. Uh, most of most of the firefighters know how to operate heavy equipment and hand tools and power tools and all those things. So uh, they're beneficial when, you know, we're doing things in, in the community, um, clearing drain lines. We rescue ducks out of stormwater. I mean, we, we do all those things, but the answer is we're, we're well versed in all aspects of that. And the answer is yes, they, they can step in and assist in those things. We don't ever want their primary mission to get muddied by what we do, but we put people in a position to help. And that goes for every city employee. And I've seen that since I've been here, that every city employee contributes where they can. So I, I couldn't be more honored to, to lead a bunch of folks that see service as a real thing. That they that they take the opportunity in front of them to assist in making the city, you know, desirable and and livable. So, I hope I answered your question. Is that a yes? The the answer is yes. Okay. Now <laughs> there there may be some legalities that right, we have to right. deal with in the in the contractual world, and that's where I'll work with legal to make sure that we don't go down a bad path or we don't abuse our folks in a in a wrong way. Right and and that can be a double-edged sword because you know sometimes we might take advantage of someone that right. is a, a servant heart so i, I got to be really cautious and protective of those that are not protective of themselves sure thank you any other final questions or comments from my colleagues hearing none i'd like to entertain a motion uh, to approve resolution number r22-071 so move motion to approve we have a motion. Uh, we have a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion passes unanimously. Congratulations. That was the end of the polled items under consent agenda. We're going to move on to the next consent section, consent bids and purchases over $100,000. I'd like to poll item 7A. Is there anything else uh, from my colleagues? And again, 7B has been removed per staff request. All right, hearing none, may I have a motion to approve the remainder of consent bids and purchases over 100,000? So moved. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion passes unanimously. Uh, we're now gonna address item 7A, proposed resolution number R22-079, award of bid number PWE22-013 for industrial weight drainage improvements, phase one. Uh, Mr. Dunmire, take us through it. Uh, yes, Mayor Pinsergut, I'm Gary Dunmire, I'm the city engineer. Uh, this is a project that I've been, had, I have had my eye on for some time. Uh, I, I scored all the roads in the city, and this was a condition F road. And as I started digging into the problems on this road, there's no drainage. And so what happens is when it rains, water stands on the road or stands on the side of the road and it undermines the base. Uh, the research I did showed back in 1979, it was a shell rock road. Back in 83, we installed water and sewer and I assume we paved it at that time. I, I don't think they did a very good job of paving it or they didn't uh, use adequate base because when I did corings on that road, there were two inches of lime rock in some areas. And since the road was done in 83, it hasn't been resurfaced. Uh, it's been patched and pothole fixed. And then waste management moved in and they have some very heavy vehicles that use that road quite a bit. So in order to make the repairs, uh, we're doing 640 linear feet of paving and we're also uh, installing drainage where there was none. And uh, this will complete uh, Boynton Beach, or it'll complete High Ridge. We just did our resurfacing in that area and it complements that project quite nicely. Thank you. Um, I pulled this item because when you see, and I think it was Commissioner uh, Hay said earlier, when you see a million dollar sticker, it, it definitely stands out. Could you tell us about how we're spending that money? I mean, is this a one-time expenditure or is this spaced out over time? I, there's no question that drainage improvements are important and paving, um, but tell, tell us how you're gonna use it. 
So what happens on this project? Well, roads usually have a lifespan of 15 years. So when I say that this road hasn't been touched in, uh, since 1983, that might lead you to the proper conclusion that the road was in dire need of service. Uh, so uh, what will happen is when we resurface this road, it'll, it'll be well uh, suited for the vehicular traffic that's using it, uh, and it'll have drainage. And so for the next 15 years, we shouldn't need to do much to this road unless there's some type of um, you know, like a vehicle falls on it and puts a long scrape in the asphalt, then we'll retouch up the surface. But we shouldn't have to touch this road for 15 years. All right. Any other questions or comments from my colleagues? Um, nope. I think I think uh, we're being proactive here. Uh, we talked about that with our vision. I do want to make a comment on something not related to this since I got you up here. Uh, the Forest Park project, I believe that was pulled today. Um, I am a little bit disappointed because that was going to be up for approval for from us and when we were at the last forest park meeting which is my neighborhood um we were told you know and i'm saying this as a resident in the neighborhood not as a commissioner we were told that y'all were going to come back with our feedback and uh, conduct another meeting yeah we're intending to do that sir okay uh that item was pulled because uh, the way i procured it wasn't quite right and i want to make sure we follow the rules um, but the idea is we're going to have the uh, raised intersections designed, mm -hmm. and that's what this contract was going to do. And then after I had the design, I wanted to share it with the residents of the neighborhood and right. let them have an opportunity to, to comment on what we're doing and what we're proposing. Right. Be before we approve to pay for anything. Uh, well, I have to get a design in order to share that design right. with the public. But yes, sir. So, okay. Um, okay. I, I want to connect with you on that. Okay. And, and, and Jim, if that's possible. Thank you. Yeah, it's a good project. I'm happy to do that. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dunmire. We have a hand from Commissioner Hay. Uh, yes, Gary. Um, you looked at just about all the streets in the city. Yes, sir. So I would probably think that you have a priority list of those who, who need more than others. Maybe this is something I may want to get with you offline, but I would like to see that list because I have some streets in mind and I want to see where they fall on your list in terms of getting uh, some assistance uh, done in those particular neighborhoods if that would be okay absolutely and uh, that is an excellent excellent well, suggestion share it with everybody yeah <laughs> send it send it to all of us we all want our roads fixed yeah. um, we understand we can't do everything but you know this is something we can address for sure again Absolutely. especially during the budget season now i have a rocks map it's my road condition scoring map and that's available on gis and i can share that link with each of you please do uh, and uh, you'll be able to see what score what scores we've got and um three years ago i had a, I had a 15 year plan it was a two million dollars a year plan plus inflation uh, and then in over 15 years, every road in the city would be four $2 million a year, plus or minus. Uh, every road in the city would be resurfaced within 15 years. And I'd like to, well, anyways, and that's why I built the rocks map. And I'm, so I'll, I'll share the link with you. And uh, if necessary, I'm happy to give a presentation in front of the board. If I can add, so I came from a city where road maintenance was not done for a good number of years. And uh, certainly if we do road maintenance, as Mr. Dunmeyer is speaking, we spend a lot less money and we have a greater result. Uh, if you have to rebuild a road from base up, which is it, what we have to do, it, ma field. it magnifies the cost tenfold. <clears throat> so uh, that is something that that I'm very familiar with. And uh, with the theme of proactive nature, <clears throat> this is we're going to have to play catch up in some places, but this will allow us to get out in front. I think the the vision of that. Uh, <clears throat> road scoring map is huge and and we did that for a hundred square mile city and most of them were in the failing state so it, it became a a very large bond issue at one point and and it never flew because the cost was too great so our ability to get out in front of this will will pay dividends in the long run so I thank you for that one last comment I, yes uh, not that i want gary's head to swell you know uh, <laughs> but uh I've been working with uh, Gary now for some time um, on various problems with streets and drainage in the, in the city. And uh, I, I can say that I like his approach. Um, you understand that, that uh, one size does not fit all. Uh, what might work in one area is not necessarily the solution in another area. So uh, I, I do commend you for that. Continue doing the job that you're doing. 
and he's easily accessible too. Uh, he, he does answer uh, his emails and calls and we even go to the site with you. So uh, keep doing what you're doing, Gary. Yes, sir, thank you. Job well done. Commissioner Kelly. Yes. Um, first, thank you for picking this road because it's a road that I travel on every day um, coming in and out of the city and it's, uh, when it rains, it's a mess. Um, so thank you for um, paying attention to the roads in the city and being proactive. My only question is, I know that we are a city and we have to save money and cut corners wherever we can. I know we picked the, or staff is recommending that we pick the lowest um, bidder on this project. I just want to know from you in your experience, is the lowest bidder um, that staff is suggesting, is it someone that the city has worked with? What is our experience with them? What is their um, what is their reputation in the community as far as getting projects done? Are they timely? Are they behind? I'm 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 wanting this to be more of more than just a, we're going to save two hundred thousand dollars on this project. Uh, we have worked with them in the past, and they will they will do the job. And and uh, if we have to twist arms or we have to pull them across the finish line, we will pull them across the finish line. So I'm comfortable with our recommendation. Thank you. That was a very blunt answer. <laughs> <laughs> Arm twisting. <Yeah. laughs> um, if there's no other comments, I'd like a motion to approve resolution R22-079. So move. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. And a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. The ayes have it. Motion passes unanimously. Okay. And um, we approved everything else? Yes, we did. I want to make sure. Moving on to public hearing. Uh, 8A is proposed ordinance number 22-013. It's a second reading. Uh, council, please take us through it. Um, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Commission, this is an ordinance of the City of Boynton Beach, Florida, amending the Land Development Regulations, Chapter 3, Article 3, Zoning Districts and Overlay Zoning, Ch Art Chapter 3, Article 4, Section 5, Nonconforming Uses, and Chapter 4, Article 9, Section 6, Historical Preservation Requirements to promote, incentivize, and facilitate the preservation of historically designated properties in the city, providing for complex everybody codification and effective date. And, Mayor, this is a public hearing. Here's it is, second reading. Right. Um, I see that. Um, Mr. Rumpf is here at the podium. I know you've already shown your presentation. Um, is there anybody here who would like to hear it again or are we good? We're good? All right. Um, did you have any additional comments, Mr. Rumpf, or was that essentially the same? No, sir. I was just gonna be here to answer any questions. Again, I'm Mike Rumpf, City's Deputy Director of Development and Liaison to the Historic Resources Preservation Board. I'm here if there are any questions. All right, excellent. Uh, we'll move on to public comment on this item. If you would like to speak on this item, uh, please approach the podium now is the time to do that oh no one okay wow uh, <laughs> i saw a thumbs up from this all right so um there's no public comments so let's bring this to a vote this is a roll call vote i tend to forget that but i remember this time um <laughs> let's begin with the roll call mayor panserger for a motion oh i'm sorry oh see i knew i was going to forget something uh may I have a motion to approve motion ordinance. to approve Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Oh, no. I, oh, roll call. I just said it. Game. <laughs> uh, it's it's okay. Um, it's a yes. Vice Mayor Cruz. Yes. Commissioner Hay. Aye. Commissioner Turkin. Aye. Commissioner Kelly. Yes. The vote is 5 0. All right. Um, the next item here is 8B. This is a table to June 21st, 2022. I believe that is on the request of the applicant. It's my understanding it may be tabled further to July 5th and okay. that will be reflected on the next agenda. Once All right. There's, so there's no action required action. on this. So we're going to proceed to city manager's report. Uh, earlier we had a question and you said we could address that now. Yes. Uh, Mario. Uh, Public Works Director will be coming up to address the specifics of that. Um, Good evening, Mayor Pesario, Commissioners, my esteemed colleagues and members of the public. My name is Mario Guzman, Public Works Director. Regarding Oyer Park, 
um, the pier. We put in an application with the Army Corps of Engineers to remove that pier. It is currently unsafe. Once that gets removed, our plans are for next fiscal year, <clears throat> excuse me, do a design. And the year following that would be construction. Regarding the boat docks, the purchase order has been issued. Um, as with most industries, we're experiencing supply issues. So we're expecting, it's tentative. As soon as we get the supply, that'll dictate the construction. But as of right now, we anticipate August, September and shutting down the docks in October. And put a big asterisk next to that, because as soon as we get the material, that'll dictate the construction. Okay, and then, um, so what is, um, I my concern is um, notifying, giving the public um, proper notice of, um, of the shutdown date of when the boat ramp would not be accessible for um, both leisure boat boating and commercial boating. So um, what once you get that uh, timeline established, what then is your turnaround as far as uh, notifying the public and what like what are the steps going to be to notify the public of the closure? We'll work with marketing. Once we get the material, once the contract gets the material, there's a lot of moving parts logistically to start the project. What we want to try to do is, you know, hopefully give at least three to four weeks anticipation, market it correctly, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, whatever, let public know. If need be, we can give a quick workshop um, to get that information out. But once we shut it down, we want the work to start immediately, not where we shut it down and we're waiting on some kind of logistics or transportation. So if need be, um, like I said, we'll put an asterisk next October. But as soon as we get the material and they're ready to work, we'll try to promote in the interim, working on the logistics, work with marketing to at least three to four weeks in advance. Okay. And yeah. then um, a yeah. quick, I'm sorry, related yeah. to that, the other thing that we already did proactively was we prorated the rates for the parking passes by two, we subtracted the two months that the ramp will be closed. So the patrons that already have the parking passes are aware that there's going to be a closure so that they know it's coming. Um, so we did that ahead of time. Um, and then can I get an update on the um, the repairs to the um, the kayak lift or the kayak, um, what's it called? I'm sorry. I'm, kayak launch. Yes, the launch. Yeah. Uh, purchase order was issued. The vendor has the railings right now and they're sandblasting them. Um, we got some material in. We anticipate hopefully by the end of this month that should be completed. But it's a uh, vendor's aware of it. They got the material, they're cleaning things up and just prepping to get everything all, all done. So we should be up and ready towards the end of the month. Okay, and then, um, sorry, my focus is on Harvard Air Park right now because I was just there um, recently and it's in a bit of disarray. So, um, and then the playground equipment, I know that it is, I don't wanna say it's new because I think it has been put in in the last probably five or six years, but it's on the ocean and it's deteriorating kind of at what I would think is a rapid pace for five, you know, fairly new equipment. What is, um, I guess, what is Park's uh, policy on evaluating the condition of the playground equipment and replacing it or repairing it? Because it is a little, the paint's peeling up, it's rusting. Um, so what, is there a, is that in a plan anywhere? The equipment currently gets inspected from a maintenance perspective. Um, it's on our schedule to get maintained and cleaned up and the aesthetics of it. Um, as far as inspection goes, and I'll have to get with Casey on that, but if I'm not mistaken, uh, inspections are done for safety. From a safety perspective, they are inspected. And if we deem anything unsafe, it gets shut down immediately. Um, let me get with staff to find out exactly that particular, and I'll get back to you with the specifics on where we're at with the maintenance and safety inspection on that okay. equipment. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks everybody. Moving on to unfinished business 10A, continue discussion on city manager's search process. Um, if our HR director could approach the podium and give us a quick overview. Good evening, Mayor and Commission. Julie Oldberry, Director of Human Resources and Risk Management. 
Um, I don't know if you've all had an opportunity to review the um, proposed search and timeline that was provided in the backup of the agenda, but I um, just wanted to, you know, let you know that that proposed timeline in search was designed as um, comprehensively as I could imagine a process. I put in um, just multiple steps and you know things of that nature for you to consider. I don't want you to be um, overwhelmed and think that you have to do every one of these exactly the way it's laid out. I really just wanted to put it there for discussion purposes so you could see the um, variety of things that you have to sort of choose from. Um, I would say that items D, E, F, and G, which are assessments, individual commission phone interviews, in-person meetings, and informal background check, those would all be options that you could select from that you don't have to do. The other pieces are somewhat required for any recruitment. So I can just leave it to you to kind of direct how you'd like to proceed or if I can answer any questions for you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my first question is, I, just to clarify, you need direction tonight to go ahead and put out a posting. Yes, sir. Okay, and did you have any questions for us uh, in order for you to do that or are you ready to go? I am ready to go with the caveat that the um, I have consensus from the commission that the existing job description, which I did provide to each of you individually, was acceptable to you and that you did not desire any changes to that. All right, thank you. Uh, as for me, I, I wanna make sure we proceed ASAP. Mm -hmm. Let's get that posting out. Uh, I wanna thank you for this very comprehensive proposal and giving us some options of what to work with. Uh, this is a little too comprehensive for me. This is a good problem, so I, I appreciate it. It gives us uh, some wiggle room and options, as you mentioned. Um, I think this is something that we can revisit to come up with a complete plan, but you've given us options to work with, and uh, I think maybe next meeting or the meeting after, uh, we can come up with a definitive process. But let's, by all means, get that posting out um, and not waste time advertising. Okay. Um, let's hear it from my colleagues. Uh, any commissioners? We have a yes from Commissioner Hay, just a nod and a yes. Uh, anything else additional from my colleagues? Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with Mayor here. Um, I don't I don't want to conduct phone interviews. That's, you know, that's your role. Um, I think in-person interviews may be important, but let's get the post out there as soon as possible. Okay, we can do that. Would you like me to come back at the next meeting with a um, revised timeline, or do you want to just, um, I don't, Let, what would be your pleasure? We'll, we'll continue to discuss it. Okay, yeah, great. But by all means, go ahead and release the notice. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. All right, and I'm sorry, uh, Commissioner Kelly. No, you're fine. My only um, feedback would be that, yes, of course, um, I feel like it, at this point, at every commission meeting, you should be prepared to come and give us an update as far as um, how many applicants have, you know, what what you're getting, um, what feedback we're getting, because one of the things that we had spoken about was if this was not um, effective, um, an effective road to go down is that we would revisit um, the other road um, with uh, hiring a company to assist us with this. So I would like to um, have you at every meeting to present to us what um, what the current position is, where we are, um, and and what we've received in the feedback um, or lack thereof, so that we can um, we can make decisions. Commissioner Kelly, I think you make a great point, and along cool. those same lines, um, perhaps we should modify that to say, come back to us perhaps after 30 days of having posted it, um, because I don't want you to come back next meeting and it's only been like a week or two. It's not enough time, so at least 30 days of, of officially being out there, then start coming back to us. Is that all right with you, Commissioner? Yes. All right. Consensus from the board? Aye. All yes. right, all right, we're on the same page. Thank you so much. Wonderful, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, moving on to new business, I have requested that we just have a quick discussion on how many of us would like to attend 
uh, the National League of Cities Conference. Uh, it is November 17th through 19th in Kansas City, Missouri. I would say that it is a must for elected officials mm -hmm. to attend where we get an opportunity not just to meet other elected officials in other cities and other states to see what they're doing, but that's the most important part. Uh, we're going through classes and workshops and seminars to see what works best in all sorts of domains. That's going to help us better serve our residents. So I definitely want to go, but I want to hear from the others. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I would Aye. confirm. I Aye. thought, thought Kendra sent out an um, email to us. Did we? Perhaps. But the point is, you want to go and. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm going. Commissioner Kelly? <laughs> That sounds like yeah. all of us. You got it. All right. I do have one minor request related to this. Um, the day before that conference starts are executive education classes. Uh, if it's all right with my colleagues, I'd like to attend one of them. The class is called Retail in Your City, Build a Plan for Success. It's focused on how to attract and retain businesses with a focus on retail recruitment and development. Um, that is something I would like to attend. It's just the day before. <laughs> if that's okay yeah well, and and it it's something that is part of this conference i'm assuming the 16th is check-in day and this is or is seven or is that on the 17th this is uh the day before the 16th so if we schedule the flights uh because this class doesn't happen until the afternoon so if i arrived in the morning uh then i can take it right in the afternoon and we just proceed this is fairly standard um uh, of the other national conferences I went to, they have classes preceding mm -hmm. the actual conference. Sure. And I wasn't sure if anybody else wanted to do that, but I, I know I definitely uh, wanted the, to. I would no, like to consider some... it. If possible, I'd like to consider, look okay. at my calendar and see if that's something that I can make work as well. Sounds good, so you're interested as well. Um, City Manager, I see you want to chime in. Yeah, the, the only thing I'll ask is whatever you're wanting to attend, just if you don't mind uh, passing that information on to Kendra and Candace. They will take care of the travel training stuff because yeah. it has to come back here as well at an uh, at a official okay. meeting right so that way we do this the right way and and that way your pre-conference registrations are taken care of yeah. your conference registrations your travel if you have any special travel needs we need to talk about that as well yeah. so uh, like arriving the day before the conference because you're going to a pre-conference event so if you don't mind just individually check in with candace or, or kendra and that way they'll be the clearinghouse. I've already prepared them for that conversation. Excellent. And I just want to also add for, for my colleagues and for the public, the reason I, I walked this on today is uh, there's early bird rates. So we're saving money by knocking it out now instead of waiting later. Um, and I'm excited that we're all going. Uh, thank you. Moving on to legal. Uh, the first item here is proposed ordinance number R excuse me, number 22-014, it's a first reading, council. Uh, did um, we, pop, did we, did you not ask that it will be postponed? So, no, uh, wrong item. This is 12A, and I think you were referring to 12 zero fourteen. Yeah. And. So 12, this is 12A right now. This is 12A. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna chime in on 12B. I got you. Okay. Um, May I read the title? Yes. In ordinance of the city of Boynton Beach, Florida, designating the property known as Casita de Sueños, located at 330 Northwest First Avenue, Boynton Beach, which is more fully described herein as a local historic site and the addition of this 1924 mission style one story single family house to the city's local registry of historical sites, excuse me, historic sites, providing for non severability clause and providing for an effective date. All right, thank you, Council. Uh, Mr. Rumpf, I believe you have a presentation. Uh, this has already been provided, so for my colleagues, do you would you like to see it or we're ready to move on? All right, um, so we're gonna move on to public comments on this item. Is there anybody who would like to speak on this item? Please approach the podium now. I see another thumbs up. I see no public comments. And uh, this is an ordinance. So first, let's entertain a motion to approve ordinance number uh, 22-014. May have that motion. To approve. We have a motion. Second. And we have a second. And we're going to do a roll call vote. <laughs> right. <laughs> Can I make a comment real quick? Um, or no? No, well, traditionally no, but that's fine. Okay, go ahead. No, no, that's fine. Oh. We'll do the vote. All right. Uh, go ahead, counsel. Or clerk. Mayor okay, Pensoga? Yes. Cruz? Yes. Commissioner Hay? Aye. Commissioner Turkin? Aye. Commissioner Kelly? Yes. The vote is 
All right, excellent. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Rumpf. Moving on to items 12B, uh, proposed resolution R22-081. Uh, Commissioner Turkin, I believe you, you raised this item. Yep, so um, I, I, I probably uh, miscommunicated why I wanted to table this, but I wanna go back and talk to the residents because this is my district, these are my constituents and hear from them um, about this. So I, I would like to get back to the pavement, knock on some more doors. Okay, excellent. Uh, we do have our utilities director here. Uh, if you could give us uh, just an update on uh, this issue and hist if you could give us also some historical context. Sure, Poonam Kalkut, uh, utilities director. <clears throat> so in 2017, I think, uh, based on a couple of uh, residents' requests, uh, the city started looking into this and talked to the county and they went through a process called MSTU, which is the Municipal Serving Taxing Unit Assessment. And uh, Palm Beach County helped do that assessment. There was surveys done and there's a requirement usually for like 51% of the people who are impacted uh, need to say yes to um, just to agree to something like this. So the I the uh, problem was that uh, there are these finger canals um, right next to Lake Ida and some of these canals get uh, clogged up with hydrilla and other uh, growth of other things like that and sometimes algae and so the request was that some, somehow maintenance needs to be done on these and so the request had been that the county do it, um, where the fish and wildlife uh, services should do it and it's, these are private canals. These are not uh, necessarily any municipality or county canals. So based on that, uh, we went through this MSTU. And, <clears throat> but after it was done, the assessment county said that they don't do MSTUs for uh, maintenance activities. It's only for capital projects and other projects like that. So at that point, uh, city took it over that we could do it as a special district. Uh, assessment and uh, do a methodology to check what maintenance needs to be done and what's the cost of that. And based on uh, the 51%, over 51% of the residents for both of those canals, uh, they agree, we started working on getting this assessment. And so this last year, we ended up uh, doing the, um, the cost was passed through the city from next year onwards, we are saying make it into a non ad valorem taxes through the uh, tax collector. So that's what this first reading is. And Michael might want to add some more. And Mr. Mayor, if, if I can also elaborate. So last year, the city uh, did this special assessment for the first year. Um, and what they did um, is they, uh, the city is the one that actually sent out the invoices, then collected the funds. This year, what these two agreements do is facilitate the use of the tax bill so that the, the property the role can be given to the property appraiser and the notice of the amount can be put on the trim notice and it'll be collected with the property taxes in november that's what these two agreements do these two agreements do not levy the special assessment so um in december i believe it was december the city commission approved what was called an intent resolution which was a notice public hearing that says we intend to put this special assessment on the tax bill next year. And so this is a furtherance of that process to convert it from a city invoice and collection to place it on a tax bill. When you go through your budgeting process in July, you'll consider this and whether you want to do this on a preliminary basis, and they'll be providing the preliminary amounts of that assessment. And that information will go on the trim notices. It'll be published in a newspaper for a public hearing in September. That will be in conjunction with your budget process and just like the fire assessment you'll have a public hearing at that point and it's only at that point is the special assessment actually levied you can pull out of that at any time up until that point you make that vote in september so what's on tonight is just the logistics of converting it from the city invoicing and collecting it itself to the logistics of placing it on the tax bill in november so um i don't hope that i, I want you know if you have any other questions on it I'd be happy to um, answer it, but that's that's what these two items are, but it does not levy the assessment. It does not set any assessment amounts. It just provides the agreements that these two entities need, the property appraiser and tax collector, to allow us to put it on the tax bill for the upcoming fiscal year. All right. Uh, thank you so much for that uh, clarification. 
uh, I have a question and then I have a comment. Let's. Uh, the, how much exactly is the assessment per resident per household Little annually? Ask. Angela. Angela Primas Utilities. Oh, thank you. Um, last year was uh, the current year. It was around eight thousand. Uh, this year we see it going out around ten thousand. And the excuse way, me per household. No, sir. Uh, per household is in dependent the, in the linear foot of waterfront. Uh, so what we do is it goes from all the way from sixty dollars to one hundred and twenty, but the average is eighty dollars a year. Okay. I want to just. Now we are talking about 103 properties only. Understood. Let me try to just recap what was said. I want to make sure I understood it, and I'll try to say it more plainly. Uh, so we have these two sets of canals uh, that are finger canals. We have all sorts of growth in them, and and that needs to be cleaned up one way or another. Originally, the county says, "Hey, we'll take care of this," uh, and then they put out a vote. They, there was some sort of voting process to do that. After that occurred, the county then said, we don't want to do it. Uh, so that right there has now misled the residents, right? Because they thought the county was going to do it, but then the county backed out. So then it became the city's responsibility, and the way to do that was this assessment. Um, the item for this evening is not to collect it, but to transfer that responsibility to the property appraiser and the tax collector. Correct. All right. So, you know, Commissioner Turkin, I'm going to support you uh, mm. how you lead on this. If you want to uh, spend more time speaking with residents, uh, absolutely more power to you. Um, I don't like how this has rolled out. It, it is misleading to the public, but that's out of our control. That's the past. That's the county. It is what it is. Uh, but one way or another, this has got to get cleaned up. Mm -hmm. um, so if the county's not going to do it, then the city has to do it. And um, so for that reason, fortunately, you know, we're talking about, you said, $80 on average per year. Yes, from 60 to 120. Okay. And we had properties that are very big, but in average, everybody pays less than $100 currently. Uh, it's going to increase, Mayor, because uh, we're going to have to charge the fee that a property appraiser is charging to set up the system. So it's going to increase probably, like I said, we're, right now it's around $8,000. It will go out a little bit over $10,000 total. Okay, so what is that, again, per I would say household? 15%. I will say, but I please don't quote me if you can't a little higher. <laughs> okay, all right, thank you. So I hope I was able to recap that accurately. Um, let's hear questions and comments from my colleagues. Uh, Commissioner Kelly, I see your hand. Yes, I just have one question. Is the reason that we're doing this or we're looking at doing this and transferring it from um, a city collectible um, item to putting it on the tax roll, did the city have trouble or issues collecting? And so now we're trying to put it where it is more um, of a guaranteed collection. Is that why we're going this route or is it, is it for, I mean, is that, I guess that is that the purpose. Did the city have trouble collecting from these properties and collecting this assessment? And so this is our way of uh, forcing collection on this assessment. I like to answer uh, Commissioner mm -hmm. Kelly. Uh, it's twofold. Uh, first of all, uh, we still had nine uh, residents that are late, and we are going to roll that into the county row. And the second, uh, the fire assessment is collected every year through that way, and it has proved to be very efficient. Uh, the, the, the issue is now to set it up. After we set it up, it will it will work very, you know, it, it, every year it will be very easy to make it work. But, but you're correct. It is, uh, it's a more uh, efficient way of collections instead of sending uh, bills and then asking again. So, and because of the fire assessment, how it's already done, the city has a mechanism of following the same process. And then um, just one kind of follow-up question of that, because uh, this is all kind of new to this um, commission or most of this commission, but um, this, um, 
how, what's the long term, like what's the term of this assessment? How many um, years are we talking about? What is the ultimate, I guess, assessment per house for this project? Um, Ish, we can, we, I mean, I know it's not. We can go back and look at that, how the assessment was done. Um, keep in mind, uh, if the city has to take over these canals, there's got to be, um, you've got to find the budget um, money to do some of this. And when they're private canals, um, it becomes very hard for the city to come up with any means to take care of those. Sure, no, I, no, and I understand that. And I understand the need um, sometimes to have these special assessments, but how many years are we collect, are we proposing that we're gonna collect uh, these funds from these residents? This is going to be a maintenance issue. So if it's a mm -hmm. maintenance issue for, for whenever, till whatever time the canals are there, then it's going to be like that. That's how I see it. It's not a capital project that you're going to say that, okay, we just got to recoup the amount of money. It's a ongoing maintenance. It's as an annual assessment, it's going to, if, if it's presented to you, then it's, up, it's going to be voted on each year up or down. So is that your way of saying permanent? Well, I if just, I... I don't know if it's permanent. I'm just pointing out that it's as an annual thing, it has to come to the commission every year. Dependent on the elected body. But if I, if I say uh, the residents were doing it themselves and they found very difficult to collect from every resident. So we had several residents approaching city management and requesting that we take over, that we assist, and we are doing it uh, as a part of services to the residents. So, you know, this discussion is about funding the, the maintenance, the cleaning up of these finger canals. The private canal. The private, yes, but do we understand the cause of this problem? Because yes, we need to take care of it, but let's we may not have to do it forever if we solve the underlying reason for why we have this problem in the first place. Is it because the water is stagnant? Well, I, don't, I don't know. So have we looked and into the underlying cause? Because these are private canals, it's hard for us to do all the assessment. I, I'm new, so I'm going to okay. go back and look at that a little bit more. But uh, really, a lot of times, they can be multiple causes. They can be non-point sources causing um, nutrients, addition, and so on and so forth, that could be causing those problems. Mm -hmm. But we live in South Florida, it is hot and humid, and a lot of these canals, the way they were made, are not necessarily flowing um, as maybe there was intended, or maybe it wasn't well thought out. I, I can't speak to that, but the, these can become a problem because of that re those reasons. I do want to just bring to your attention that there are, for example, in the Long Canal, I, re I forget what, what that's called. Um, like between Diana sure. Drive and yes. uh, South, yeah, it's uh, the very long Ida Canal, I believe. I, there are these culverts there, and I'm not sure if they're sufficient to allow for, for flow of, of uh, the water. So uh, please take a look at that, because I, I want to make sure we take care of underlying causes so we don't have to keep doing the assessments over and over. Let's solve it temporarily if it's a temporary issue. Or... Yeah, I I would just like to caution that if we as a stormwater utility are being asked to look at private canals and assess uh, uh, them, understood. there's a cost to it. So we just need to... Who would decide how the funds are spent? I assume the city, but I want to make sure I pose that question. So the funds collected, who 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 then uses that money? Because we collect stormwater fee, and we we can do a rate studies for stormwater assessment, but that these canals are not part of that stormwater. Um, Understood. Conveyance. But I'm referring to the assessment, these you know the collected dollars from the assessment. You, usually, it would be the homeowners or homeowners associations or any kind of management uh, of that area that would be doing these things. That they would be taking care of the maintenance, but because there is no HOA in that area. It's been something that uh, residents haven't been able to collectively okay. get a vote to get something done, and that's why they've approached the city. So I, the point that I'm making here is whoever is the jurisdictional authority on that, that that money is spent not only in solving the temporary issue of overgrowth and, and whatnot, but some of those funds um, in whatever duration of time is required is used to solve the under 
line problem. But that's the point that I'm making. But uh, but thank you. Um, any other questions or comments, that, Commissioner Hay? Is that the reason why the county backed out because it's privately owned, or do you know? Uh, at least based on some of the um, emails I've read, it's because it's a maintenance uh, issue, and they usually don't do maintenance uh, issues. They usually do capital and others. That's that's my understanding. So the mayor brought up a good point that culver. I think that culver. When is that is if we look in that culvert, that's not a maintenance issue. That would be a capex, correct? Yes. So I, what I'm getting at is, I think we need to look at what's going on. Uh, you mentioned a study. If we can do that, um, and I'd I'd like to uh, get you in contact with Mr. Fishman, who's worked very hard, who is a resident of Diane Drive, and he's worked very hard to clear out those weeds. Um, so I'd, I'd like to get you in contact with him, and he can sure. kind of tell you a little bit more. He's lived there years and years and years, so he's he, he's seen the progression of what's going on with that canal. <clears throat> uh, but again, to my colleagues, I would like to get some more feedback about this issue. All right, any other questions or comments from uh, the commission? Otherwise, I'd like to move this on to public comments on this item. Council, you had a just, comment? Just real quick, um, we'll bring this back at the at the next meeting um I, I, I'm, we can find out in the meantime whether these two entities will have some sort of deadline um before you engage in your july discussions on how to collect it um if you don't pass these and you still want to do the assessment we'll do it the same way we did it this year so all this is again is the logistics of converting it from a city collection to the tax bill so we'll make an effort to just confirm that they're, they're not looking for it by date specific and if they are We'll uh, we'll let you know. Perfect. Thank you. Anything else? All right. Thank you. We still need. You, you said, Council, you wanted to bring this back. So, do we still need public comment and a motion, or you you can have public comment if you like. It's on the agenda, but we. Can, I, we I see you. At least one person standing. Um, let, let's go. Ahead, let's proceed with public comment. I want to make sure everybody has an opportunity. Um, approach the podium and begin when you're ready. Mike Fitzpatrick, 175 Southwest 2nd Street. First of all, yes, it's probably uh, a lot of it comes from, as was pointed out, the runoff from uh, fertilizer from everybody's lawn is, is probably the root cause for a lot of this and the stagnation. Um, the reason it's such a big mess, if I remember correctly, like at least 10 years ago, between 10 and 15 years ago, some Sharpie uh, lawyer or developer or something's started going around and noticing that all these, when they built these developers, these canals, who owned them? And somehow he bought up the property and of these canals and it didn't just happen here. They also had this problem in Ocean Ridge. And then he would go back to all the homeowners and say, hey, your dock is on my property. How much do you want to pay per year to be able to keep it there? So that caused a lot of, you know, angst among all the property owners. So that's when they started bringing it to the city. So I heard something about, you know, it's privately owned. It's like you're dealing with whoever owns it now, if it's the same person or whoever that is, I would say don't reward him with too much money. I mean, this was an intentional weirdness way of uh, manipulating a system and just wanted to put in that little historical perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Any others uh, who would like to speak on this item, go ahead, approach the podium and begin when you're ready. Uh, my name is Rick again. Um, I come from a place that has a lot of water and what I would suggest in this particular area is to deprivatize the canals, make it part of a strategic overlay of a canal system for the city so that it transfers maintenance and have the property taxes transferred to the whole of the property owners and then there would be no issue get the corps of engineers from the army to take a look at the progress or the problems get an assessment from them because they are far more qualified than probably anybody here in the county thank you thank you any other um, in-person public comments on this do we have anybody online who has their digital hands raised to speak on this item? Mayor, this is Manny. We do not have any hands raised online. 
All right, thank you, Mani. I heard that there were no hands raised. Um, so if you know the consensus here is to table this, let's entertain a motion to table this item. Motion to table. We have a motion oh, and a second. Both items, B and C, if they're together. <laughs> Could we lump them together? Fine. For All a, right. For a table. Thank you. Yes. To be clear, the motion is to table items 12B and C. Do we need two separate motions for that? No, she's saying he's saying we, we can both lump them together. They're, they're, they're related. All right, so we have a motion and do we have a second? Second. We have a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion passes unanimously. 12B and C have been tabled. Are there any other final comments or questions from the commission? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to meeting. adjourn. Oh, hold on a second. That's all right. So fast. Um, I would like staff to reach out to this gentleman about the trail bikes um, and then get some more information about the baseball diamond too. Yep. Okay. Let's let's continue with that motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. And a, and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. The ayes have it. Have a great evening, everybody. This meeting is adjourned.